Thank you. Thank you and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Packle. Welcome to Threshold of Hope. This is our chance to bring you a program where we go through the writings of Pope John Paul the Great. Now, before we get to our emails and to the topic tonight, I want to mention that today is celebrated by us Jesuits as the feast of St. Peter Canisius. St. Peter Canisius was born in 1521, died in 1597. He entered the society uh, as one of the very first Jesuits in the 1540s as a young man. And when he entered the Jesuits, uh, the church was in a chaos in his homeland. He was born uh, in, near the border between Holland and Germany. And as a matter of fact, his original name is Peter de Hunt, uh, but he changed Hunt to Canis, which is Latin word for dog, so, or hound. So uh, Peter de Hunt uh, began working in Germany going up and down the Rhine Valley. In fact, first of all, he was formed by spending some time with Cistercian monks uh, in uh, Cologne, Germany, uh, where the bishop had already left the church. The bishop had already become a Lutheran. And in many other places, there was wide, widespread problems. But Peter Canisius began going around uh, the Rhine Valley and eventually into Austria and Prague and sending uh, men to Poland as well, which had also become quite Lutheran. And he would first of all begin by preaching to the priests and bishops because the reform needed to begin with them. And then from after talking to them and giving them retreats and helping them to bring their lives, I mean, it was so bad. He wrote a letter to St. Ignatius Loyola saying, I am blessed if I can find one or two priests in any city who is not living openly with his girlfriend. You know, though he would, they said an open concubinage, but that's what it meant. And this was the, the kind of situation. But preaching the gospel has an effect to reform lives. And those sections came back to the Catholic faith, including Poland. He also started schools, you know, the, the famous Jesuit schools in uh, that Rhine Valley and Austria. And those were very instrumental in winning people back to the Catholic faith and reunifying that part of Germany with the church. One of his other great accomplishments was to write the first catechism for Catholics. There had been no other catechisms. It was just a form of speech we didn't use. He uh, wrote the first and uh, he wrote a second one, a bigger one, a smaller one. So he was very instrumental and is uh, not only a great pastor, but also a doctor of the church. Because when he debated people, he did so with consummate charity. Most of the people on both the Catholic and Protestant side were pretty nasty to each other, calling each other all kind of bad names and uh, bad motives being attributed to them. He was charitable to his opponents. And this was why he not only was teaching the f truth of the faith, but he also did it with love. And we have to learn to do the same in our own time. All right, now we have some emails I want to deal with from you. First one, uh, remember you can send emails by writing to threshold at EWTN.com. First email, hi, Father Mitch. I'm a Protestant convert just this last year, and I'm so excited about my newly found faith. I was really looking forward to Divine Mercy Sunday as I pray the chaplet often. I was so disappointed when my parish didn't even mention it during Sunday Mass. Is Divine Mercy Sunday an option for the parish, or what do you think happened here? I was going to ask the priest directly, but I didn't want to seem like I was complaining, being so new in the faith. Dan from Minnesota. Good idea, Dan. Before you start the complaints, hang around a little bit longer. <laughs> Join the rest of us. Actually, the Divine Mercy is an option. It's officially declared Divine Mercy Sunday by Pope John Paul, but it's, it's something that, you know, is not required. And I'm afraid that there are sometimes priests and parishes that don't like such devotions. They don't like the devotional approach to the faith. I don't think that's wise. That's something that came out of the 60s in some ways and 70s, but it, it's, it, I don't think it's a, a wise approach. But, you know, as time goes on, instead of complaining, gently ask, gently encourage, 
and that's a, that's a far more effective way so that it would be known. And if the priest says, well, why don't you organize something for us? Then Dan, go ahead and do it. So you're part of your mission, I'll bet. All right, next one. Dear Father Mitch, I have a question. When Jesus is at the tomb, he tells Mary Magdalene not to touch him since he hasn't seen the Father yet. However, when he meets with the apostles and Thomas uh, is there, he tells him to touch his hands and side. Did he go up to the Father first and then come back to the apostles? Mary in Madison, Wisconsin. Well, Mary, we don't know about that. Uh, but there, there's a difference in the kind of touching that's going on between uh, Mary Magdalene and Thomas. Mary Magdalene wanted to cling to him. And there's a different verb used to cling. And, he, and you can't hang on to him like you won't let him go because he does need to ascend to the Father. Whereas Thomas was asking for evidence that it's the same Jesus who died on the cross that's standing there. And so he could touch the wounds, but he didn't, couldn't cling to them. So that was the difference. So, uh, and, and, and even in the Greek, you see a difference in clinging and touching going on. All right. And then, uh, uh, hello, Father Mitch. My question today is, how correct is it to have a May king and a May queen for the May procession and crowning of Mother Mary. I belong to the church for 11 years now, and one of the things that I adore is the honor and love that is shown to Mother Mary. My thought is that she is queen, and as sons and daughters of God, we're stepped into God's royalty. But to give titles of May king and queen to those selected to crown her sounds more like we're celebrating a Maypole dance rather than the Blessed Mother. This is from Amy in Maryland. Well, Amy, I'm afraid you're right. <laughs> it does sound like a Maypole celebration. Uh, th there was uh, a, a feast known as Beltrain, I believe, uh, among the Druids you know, of uh, the old Celtic times. And they would celebrate May as a time when the flowers come out, especially in, uh, they w that wasn't Alabama. They, uh, the flowers tend to come out here earlier than they do over in England. But they uh, would, in May, the flowers are out, and they would celebrate it with a certain amount of, you know, uh, spring fever kind of celebrations. You know, that was you know, romance and things like that. And that's what the May king and queen were about. Uh, sometimes she was called king of the oaks and she was called queen of the flowers. That's not appropriate for the May crown. As a matter of fact, when I remember uh, as a kid, only girls got the crown our lady. The boys didn't do anything with that. So um, that was the, the, something the girls got to do. Uh, we got to be servers and stuff, but girls got the crown our lady. Uh, and that was sort of neat, you know, actually. Um, and uh, we don't, I, I've never heard the persons, usually children, who crown the our lady as being the may king or may queen. Uh, I just, I, I think that sounds like it's borrowing something from the bell train uh, celebration and uh, wh what's going on in May crowning, and I would probably not do that. I just say they're the because again, you're right. Uh, your point is exactly correct. It takes away from Our Lady being the queen of the whole thing, and that's the focus on May crowning. So I, I, I don't like that. I don't like. It. Sounds funny to me. All right. Let's now take a look at the document, Pastores Dabo Vobis. This is Pope John Paul's exhortation on the priesthood. You can download a free copy of this electronic copy from our website, EWTN.com. If you go to the television tab at the website and click television series, then you scroll down to threshold of, threshold of hope, uh, click there, and you see that this document is linked and you can load it into your computer for free and print it out for whatever you want to pay for paper and ink. We are on paragraph 71, which is entitled, The Different Dimensions of Ongoing Formation. And we're talking about the ongoing formation of priests. But this applies to all of us. You know, all of us have to keep on forming ourselves in the faith. The idea that, well, I went to get my confirmation when I was 16, and now I know everything there is to know about the faith. I don't think so. <laughs> I, I went to the 27th grade. I have degrees in theology, and I sure don't know everything, so I'd say let's uh, keep on studying all of us. 
But here we're talking about priests, and then we can apply it to ourselves, whatever state we might be in. So the ongoing formation of priests, whether it be diocesan priests or religious priests, that is, priests who belong to a religious order, uh, is the natural and absolutely necessary continuation of the process of building priestly personality. So that the, the personality of the priest is going to continue to develop one way or the other, just like everybody else's personality continues to develop. And you can either develop in a way that is mature, or you can develop in a way that is immature, right? And this happens to people. And sometimes at stages of life, uh, we're tempted to all kinds of immaturity. For instance, um, midlife crisis. Uh, a lot of guys are tempted to get cars like they dreamed about when they were 16, only they're 46. <laughs> that would be a less mature approach. Um, probably. Cool, cool. Uh, the cars are cool, I, I, I admit. But not exactly mature. Um, or you can develop uh, more maturely. And the, that development of priestly personality began at the seminary or religious house, but uh, when they're, when they're getting, getting ready for ordination. But there should be a continuing development for the priests of uh, the, their formation and the development of their personality. It's particularly important to be aware of and respect the intrinsic link between the formation before ordination to the priesthood and formation after. So that, you know, and this should be, again, true for any vocation. The formation that you had before you, you got married, the preparation is one step, but you should have a formation that continues on after marriage that's linked intrinsically to it. You don't, you know, uh, you don't surprise your spouse and say uh, that I'm going to stop uh, any work on my career and I'm just going to go be a clown, you know, which some such person might already be. But that's another problem. But, you know, the, the same thing with priesthood, that there should be a link between what you do before ordination and what you do afterwards. So there's a continuity in living out the vocation, a continuity in the development and maturity of the, the personality of the priest. Should there be a break in con continuity, or worse, a complete difference between these two phases of formation, there would be a serious and immediate repercussions on the pastoral work and on fraternal communion among priests, especially those in different age groups. Well, is he just saying this out of theory? No. We lived this. We lived it. How often in the 60s and 70s the younger priest would go for continuing ed and get some new workshop about some brand new idea. And the divisions between the older priests and the younger priests were sometimes pretty bad. As a matter of fact, uh, sometimes we refer to that period when I was a young seminarian and on the, by the way, I have to admit, I was on the side, let's do all this new stuff. Let's try this, because I was new. What did I know? So, uh, you know, let's try all these new things. New fads are coming, let's try them. And let's try this one, and this one, and this one. And some of the older guys were saying, this is going to be trouble. And, uh, and we would just say, oh, you're stuck in the mud, you're old fuddy-duddies, and things like that. And that didn't exactly help priestly communion. That's what he's talking about here. There was a rupture between the way things were done. And we, we refer to those times as the period of the wars of religion. Inside religious life, inside the seminaries, inside the religious orders. And sometimes, you know, feelings were very, very negative and, and bitter. So that's what he's talking about. And there was a mood to reject the way we always did things in the past. Because in the 60s and 70s, that was the tone of the culture. We don't want to keep doing the same old thing. Let's do new stuff. Let's be radical. And um, most of those new radical things have faded away because after a while they were so superficial that they became boring to continue doing, so we don't do them much anymore. 
Not everything. There were some good changes that happened, but a lot of very foolish changes. So that's what he's talking about, because it really did happen. Ongoing formation is not a repetition of the formation acquired in the seminary, um, where you simply review or expand uh, with a few new suggestions. That's not the idea of continuing formation. It, it, it would be, again, in families. You don't just go back over and over again what you heard from the priest or the deacon or the couple that did your premarital counseling. There are new things to learn. Are there not? There's some surprises about how you deal with various financial issues. And when you're first married, do you tell a whole lot about how to raise children? No. Hopefully you haven't got them yet. Uh, you know, but by the time you've been married a while, you need to get skills in how you train uh, little kids, how you train teenagers. How do you deal with young adults? And, and there there's, should be continuity, but you don't keep saying, well, someday you'll have kids and you know, you'll have a lot of fun when you have kids. Yeah, I know, I've got five teenagers now. Tell me what I don't know. <laughs> like, how do you deal with them when their moves are swinging back and forth? <laughs> and they're driving the whole house nuts. <laughs> you know, the, these are the things that you need to know to develop. That's a development from what you heard in pre-Cana. But you didn't hear about that back then because you didn't need to know it as later stages you do. Same thing with us priests. We don't just keep repeating the same things we heard in seminary. That's not what the continuing ed is about. Ongoing formation involves relatively new content, especially new methods. Because again, a young priest just needs to learn how to say mass correctly, how to hear confessions correctly, and so on. But as he moves along, he may be a pastor. And he may not understand how to do the finances in the parish, how to do marriage counseling. He may need to learn that as time goes on. He may need to learn a lot more about how to run a school if his parish has a school. He didn't need to know that when he first came out of seminary, but these are the kinds of skills that he'll have to develop. And that there'll be, a, a, that there should be a harmonious, vital process rooted in the formation you received in the seminary. So the, the basics that you learn there, then get developed. And you, there, there are calls for adaptations because things change. For instance, uh, when I was ordained, there were no such things as desktop computers. They didn't exist. <laughs> they didn't exist. Matter of fact, I was one of the first students at Vanderbilt to write my dissertation on a computer. But we didn't have desktops. We had to use dumb terminals to connect to the mainframe because they didn't exist yet. But eventually they did. Well, these are adaptations that we then have to adjust because a lot of parishes put their finances on uh, the, the computers, desktop computers. So you have to learn the programs. That, that would be a, a simple example. But there are, of course, more complicated ones. Um, and you have to learn updating and modifications. Uh, without sharp breaks in continuity. Uh, for instance, uh, what we're going to be having to train a lot of the priests and laity about the new translation of the liturgy. That'll be, it's in continuity with what we had before but, and what we have now, but we will have to learn that. So those would be the kind of adaptations too uh, and, and things like that. On the other hand, long-term preparation for ongoing formation should take place in the major seminary. So you don't spring the idea on the guys after they're ordained. Oh, by the way, uh, you got to do some continuing ed. No, you, you let them know when they're in the major seminary before ordination that you should expect, prepare them to expect conti continuing formation. That even though you're done, and as my brother-in-law did uh, when I got ordained, he gave me a set of Mickey Mouse ears. He said, now nah, you got your ears. <laughs> I was like one of the musketeers. No, no, no. It's not like you're done. There's still a lot more to learn. And you, just because you're ordained doesn't mean you're finished. That's for sure. And so you have to encourage future priests to look forward to the uh, formation, seeing it as necessary, and see the advantages and the spirit in which you're supposed to do this uh, to make sure that it does get done and we continue to learn more. And, you know, that's a, I can recall. 
right after ordination. I did not like the idea that we would be doing a continuing formation because it's not just, you know, finished all these years of school. I'm tired of school. I want to go out and do some work. But, you know, again, it wasn't very long before I realized, uh, especially as I started hearing confessions, that there were a lot of cases that came up in confession that they had not prepared us for. Now, I have to admit, <laughs> I started hearing confessions on Chicago Skid Row. So, <laughs> so there are a few cases I hadn't heard of before. So, but, you, you know, you got to, you know, so I had to study more moral theology. By the very fact that ongoing formation is continuing the earlier formation in the seminary, so that you're just you know, continuing on what you started, the aim is not to have a purely professional approach. This is deadly. And I, I hear about, a, a, a priest friend of mine was complaining about how too many priests want to see themselves as professionals. Well, th there is a professional quality that we should have in terms of knowing what we're doing and, you know, following the, the rules of things and knowing uh, professional boundaries, what we can do, what we can't do, and being competent at our job, you know, our various jobs and tasks that, that are part of, like, running a parish and so on. But the idea is not that we are professionals in the sense that lawyers and doctors are. This is beyond professionalism. This is a commitment to our vocation. And that's something that's very important. And you, you don't just learn a few pastoral techniques. Oh, yeah, if you cut this part of the budget out here and this one, this one, you'll save a lot of money and uh, the IRS will never know. No, 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 no. <laughs> you don't do that. It's not a few professional techniques like that. Instead, the goal, the aim of continuing formation is to promote a general integral process of constant growth because maturity needs to be constant throughout life and a deepening of aspects of the formation. And the, the four aspects of formation we've been talking about since the beginning of this document, that is the human formation, the spiritual formation, intellectual formation, and pastoral formation. Those four elements are constants throughout this document, and he's now going to uh, uh, have us take a look at that in terms of what the priest should be doing for continuing formation in his human, spiritual, intellectual, and pastoral formation. Keeping in mind that they have to be integrated. You don't this is one of the key elements of everybody's maturity. To have authentic maturity, you have to integrate your personality as opposed to compartmentalize. Compartmentalize means, all right, I've got my ideas and my intellect over here. I've got my emotions over here. I've got my professional skills and pastoral skills as a priest over here, and they don't intersect. That's putting things into compartments. When we compartmentalize our lives and put, and this applies to everybody, when we compartmentalize, then we are in danger of ignoring certain aspects. We can pretend they're not there, and that's not healthy. It's the integration of these, and to do so on the basis of pastoral charity. My goal as a priest is to have a charity or a love toward others that is self-giving for the sake of being their shepherd and loving the sheep, for the sake of the church as my bride and the children of the church as the family that we belong to. This is the, the, abs the reference point for us. So it goes on. The first aspect is the human aspect. Let's start off with that. Uh, and the human aspect of uh, priestly formation, that's the starting point. Why? Because you can't stop being human. God did not ordain the angels. He didn't. He ordained human beings. So all the different foibles and weaknesses and strengths of being human is what goes on in the priesthood. 
and we have to mature in our human aspect. Now, this is going to come through daily contact with people and sharing in their daily lives because people, you know, that's one of the great things about being a priest. People say, well, you know, some, you guys are celibates. You're not married. You don't understand what it's like to be married. And in one sense, we don't. But in another sense, we know more about it than a lot of you because married people are more willing to talk to us celibates than they are to other married people. <laughs> Any number of times they've told me things that I would never tell this to my married friends, but you I can talk to. Because for one thing, I don't have anybody at home to talk about it with. It stays with me. That's one of the advantages they, that they say. And so... We share in daily lives of people and, and many of the intimate aspects of life. What's happening with finances, what's happening psychologically, what's going on in terms of marital relationship, what, on, what's happening with your kids, why my kids don't like me or I don't like them, you know, all these things. And that happens. So, you know, these are some of the things they have to do. And in that, the priest needs to develop his human sensitivity so as to understand more clearly their needs and pay attention to their needs, respond to their demands, perceive their, the questions they don't know how to put into words. Sometimes, you, and after you've been working with people for a while, you get a sense, is this what's going on? You have a hunch because you've seen these kind of things before. And you also want to share their hopes and expectations and say, you shouldn't hope that you and your family keep on growing and living well and pay off the house. That's too worldly. No, you shouldn't be worried about uh, the house and the car payment and all those other things. And how can we help? You know, not just pay it off, but help you deal with it. Also dealing with the joys and burdens that are in life. And that we want to enter with, into a dialogue with everybody. Not just a few people that are my friends. Anybody that comes, we enter into a dialogue with them. In particular, to come to know and share uh, with their experiences by making their human experiences our own. You empathize with their human suffering, uh, whether it be poverty or illness, or whether it be rejection, whether it be ignorance and lack of education, loneliness, or material poverty or moral poverty. And the priest can cultivate his own humanity and make it more genuine and more clearly apparent by his ardent love for his fellow man. See, that's why it's not about professionalism. You do this because you love them. Same way with being a parent. Is being a parent about being professional? No, you love those kids. You love them. And that's part of what you do. Because you love them, you do what you can to take care of them. And that's the attitude that you take. So it's not, it's not about professionalism. It's about a love for them and entering into their lives. All right, I'm going to take a little break, and we'll come back and continue on with this segment, so, uh, as well as questions from our audience here. So please stay with us. and welcome. We have a nice, nice audience here uh, from different parts of the country, uh, from New Hampshire uh, all the way over to Huntsville, Alabama, and Michigan and other places. And we'd love to have you come and join us. If you can make it here, please contact our pilgrimage department. You can call them at 205-271-2966 or go to our website, www ewtn.com and I'll help you with places to stay and scheduling of masses and all the things going on in the show uh, and uh, over in Hansville as well. Also want to start letting people know uh, a lot of people have been asking already uh, for the last uh, two months so I'll start letting you all know I'll be having another pilgrimage to the Holy Land. We're planning on doing that December 15th to the 26th. 
and will be, God willing, again uh, in Bethlehem for Christmas Eve Mass. Uh, we will, uh, you can contact more information by going to 1 800 554 4556. 1 800 554 4556. Or go to my website, uh, www.fathermitchpacwa.org, and Father is spelled out. Uh, also at that website, you can find out if you live in the Oklahoma City, Oklahoma area. I'll be speaking there this coming weekend, in fact. And you can find out the place because uh, I have to do the same thing. I have to go to my website to see where I'm going next. Because <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> also, uh, today uh, there was a press conference here in Birmingham, Alabama, in the historic Kelly Ingram Park. Uh, that's where a lot of the, uh, some of the racial problems of the early 60s uh, took place. Uh, but the Freedom Riders of 1961 took their lives in their hands to protest the injustice of segregation and to test a Supreme Court ruling that struck down segregation laws, especially on interstate travel on the buses. And this summer, Priests for Life and its supporters will stage a pro-life Freedom Ride along various routes. There'll be a number of these Freedom Rides. And the time for the Freedom Riders will be speaking up for the lives of the unborn by protesting a ruling of that same Supreme Court that legalized the murder of a whole class of human beings. The pro-life Freedom Rides are nonpartisan, interdenominational, nonviolent movement that will begin with a period of prayer from May 23rd until July 4th. And then the rides themselves will begin July 21st. For more information, please go to www.prolifefreedomride.com. Prolifefreedomride.com, that's one word, pro-life freedom ride. Uh, I think it's a good idea. Um, who, who's the one in charge of Homeland Security? Is that Napolitano? Secretary Napolitano? Yeah, Janet Napolitano. And she said to be careful of the, uh, uh, one of the people that you should keep your eye on for security reasons were the pro-lifers. Um, hey, keep your eye on us, but learn something while you're doing it. All right, let's go over to our questions here from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? Texas. Where are you from in Texas? Plano, Texas. Aren't you some? <laughs> I live not too far away from Plano over by the gallery area right. at Jesuit High. And what's your question? Well, I, I was under the impression that maybe some of the previous generations prior to the John Paul generation of priests may have not gotten this ongoing formation that you're talking about. And so I was wondering what programs are in place in the diocese and in the orders to, to enact what we're reading about right now. Okay, uh, a couple things. First of all, in the uh, since the Vatican Council, there has been a lot of ongoing formation available to priests. There really has. But there were a lot of experiments. That's what I was talking about earlier. There were a variety of experiments of different kinds of formation. So, for instance, um, I, re I recall some of the uh, workshops uh, that would be on things. Well, one of them I attended was on the Enneagram. Now, since then, since I had studied it, and I said, oh, this is very interesting, and oh, I liked it at first, but then I kept on studying, and I said, oh, this is wacky, this is dumb. And so I wrote my book, Catholics in the New Age, criticizing it, um, and uh, sometimes to other people's chagrin. But, uh, you know, that's uh, one, one of the examples. But there were uh, all kinds of workshops that were done and the continuing, uh, I, I, another one I remember where uh, uh, teaching priests about Solinsky, uh, Saul Alinsky style organizing, you know, um, again, not one of the things that worked out all that well. Uh, I, I participate in that too. So there were a variety of things available uh, and some were very solid you know, scripture study and uh, homiletic studies and all sorts of very good, solid things. So it was a mixed bag uh, in, in the past. Uh, I think now, uh, having tried a lot of experiments and experiments failed, then you don't do those anymore. So that, that's what I think is going on today. Sir, where are you from? I'm from Hopkinton, New Hampshire. That's near Concord. 
We okay, have. great, great. And what's your question? Well, in last week's television program, you talked about priests in, in the abuse problem. And the point you're making is that the percentage of priests is something like 1.7%. Yes. And, but there are other uh, religious organizations and other professions that perhaps uh, have much higher, and they do. They do. They yes. do. Again, I recommend there's a, a businessman, a Jewish businessman named Miller from Cleveland, who wrote, uh, you know, based on some Protestant sources, uh, he, was t he was basically saying, Catholics, stand up and defend yourselves. You do a lot of really great things. There's this problem, but it's not the worst problem out there. And a lot of other professions and other religions have even bigger problems than you do, and you're dealing with it better than many of the others. So uh, you can look that up on the uh, Internet. In that. Yeah, but in that, that's a good article. I wonder, like uh, EWTN and people like you uh, cover the topics uh, quite well and bring it to our attention. But could it possibly be done at a parish level with the pastor Absolutely. and the la laity? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, uh, many people in parishes don't see our programs here. Uh, but for those of you who do, uh, it would be well worth it to take a look, say, at that article by Mr. Miller, uh, who is, is trying to be a fair broker. He's not, you know, he doesn't have a Catholic ax to grind. Again, he's a Jewish gentleman, but he wants fairness. And that would be a great thing to bring to folks in your parish. Suggest a, a study group in your parish. And, you know, maybe after a Sunday Mass or something, and, and say, look, what, and what do we do to help in this situation? You know, that doesn't mean that it's our fault. No, it's the fault of the perpetrators of these crimes and mis misconduct. But we also have to uh, uh, do what we can to help, you know, with the church's growth and to stand up for where we should stand up and be critical where we should be critical. Uh, and, and not just follow uh, the, the lead of some of those uh, news organizations who have fewer viewers than the Cartoon Channel. <laughs> CN, Cartoon Network. There's one like that that has this lower viewership. Yes. Father, I'm from Middletown, New York. Great, good to and, have you. You've and, been here uh, before, good to have you back. Yes, thank you. Um, Father, you know, when we were talking about the ongoing formation of priests, um, we know that in seminaries, um, now uh, young seminarians are being trained for the extraordinary form of the mess. Now, is this going to also be required for um, uh, guys who've been priests for a while to be trained in the um, extraordinary form of the mess? So, will... Uh, uh Basically, the older priests be required to study the extraordinary form? No. It's an option. It, they may uh, learn it if they wish, mm -hmm. but they, it's not required. And, so, uh, and it's not required for any priest to do, do so, unless, of course, that priest's bishop tells him, look, I need somebody to do the extraordinary form. Would you do it? Would you learn how to celebrate that? I don't know how to celebrate it. I served it. Uh, growing up as a boy, but I never learned how to be the celebrant of it. So, uh, you know, uh, if there was a need, I would. Uh, at this point, you know, I'm uh, pretty uh, busy with uh, a much more traditional form. And the Maronite liturgy uses Aramaic, so Latin is kind of a modernism for me. <laughs> but it's, uh, you know, it's, but if there's a need, then uh, my spirit said I need to do that, then I'll do that. But if there's, you know, others who take care of that need, then they can do that. But it, 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 it should be available to learn, and the videos that we have and others have, but uh, it's not required, not required, because it's extraordinary. I have one last question. Sir, where are you from? I'm from Belleville, Illinois, Father. Great. If, if some people doesn't know where Belleville, Illinois is, I'm just 17 miles from downtown St. Louis. There you go. So it's not that far from St. No, Louis, no, but no, on the no. Illinois side. And they are on, on the, yeah, on the right. east side of the Mississippi. Right. And what's your question? Uh, well, my question and probably suggestion is, we mentioned about continuing education. Yes. This weekend will be the starting of May, and 
most schools and colleges will use the word graduation. Yes. And most also speakers throughout the country will also use the word members of the graduating class. Right. So these people who are members of the graduating class, since they use the word graduation, oh, I'm done, I'm finished. But instead of that, why not use an alternative? Use the word commencement, meaning to, this is only the beginning of my career. After my graduation, I'm, if I graduated from the college so, 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 hey, you're not done. Okay. It's only the beginning. It's the, that's why we call it commencement. But very few colleges and universities and even speaker, guest speaker of the school and colleges seldom use the word commencement. And last but not least, probably you can also help those people, members of the graduating class, in, include it in your homily for a word or two. Hey, kids. Were you See, sent here by somebody? No. <laughs> because, because I'm actually going to be doing the commencement address oh. for Steubenville University. Franciscan oh, University I, of I Steubenville. I didn't know that. It's, just, and it, all, it's a matter of coincidence, Father. So I just want to see if Father Mike Scanlon set you up for this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're giving me an honorary doctorate, and uh, I'll be doing the commencement service. Uh, but that's, that's a good idea, and I think I, I like the idea, because it gets across the, the issue that we are commencing our education just because you finish college you know it doesn't mean that you stop growing any more than a chick who breaks out of its egg has stopped growing you just got out of the shell now it's time to get the real growth going right and then you get cooked no 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 no, no. <laughs> all righty let's now continue on here we're still talking about the human development that goes on here in paragraph 72 of Pastorius Diabol Bobis, 72.2. Now, in bringing, in this task of bringing human formation to maturity, the priest receives special assistance from the grace of Jesus Christ. Now, this is a very important aspect here for all of us to pay attention to, that the grace of Christ helps us mature. First of all, the charity of Christ, the Good Shepherd, is revealed by the fact that He redeemed us. He saved us from sin. And that is something for which we are eternally grateful. He died on the cross and rose from the dead. But He also chose to share our life. That's why in the beginning of John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 14, it says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. And we have beheld His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. Christ, the only Son, became flesh. Now, a lot of times this is embarrassing. As a matter of fact, some people, you know, give a, a silly argument. To me, very silly. As a matter of fact, silly to the point of dangerous. When they say uh, that Christ said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you cannot have eternal life, right? And then after that, when the disciples don't want to believe him and want to leave, he says that the flesh avails nothing, but you, this is something you understand in the spirit, all right? So the flesh avails nothing, only the spirit counts. So some people then try to say, well, see, the flesh of Jesus doesn't count for anything. Do you really want to say that? That God the Son became flesh and it means nothing? I don't want to say that at all. And to say that the flesh of God incarnate means nothing is going way too far. I think that sometimes they're trying to make a rhetorical point in an argument and they neglect paying attention to the reality of what's going on here. So that can be foolish. No, rather, um, the word becoming flesh, Jesus, the word of God made flesh, uh, desired to know our joys and our sufferings. He understood that. And think of how his family had to pull up and go to Egypt and then come back and all this, and his own experiencing of various sufferings by being in this human life. Also, he experienced weariness. He just got tired. And the crowd still would come. So then he'd 
get that, you know, second, you know, drive of energy and, and then, you know, continue preaching and teaching. But he also shared our feelings and he was able to console sadness. Uh, you know, remember with uh, Martha and Mary after Lazarus died. Or, the, you know, one of the places I loved, I love taking people to, is Na'in. Na'in is the village where the, wo the widow with an only son was taking her son's body to be buried. And he raises him from the dead. Unless you're there, you don't understand it as well. But the, from the first time I went there, I, could, I recognized. From Na'in, you can look across the Jezreel Valley. And what do you see? Nazareth where another widow with an only son who would die and be buried and yet get her son back in the resurrection was living. So I'm sure that he felt empathy with that widow with the only son because his own mother was a widow with an only son. And he understood that and out of compassion raised her son up. He understood our feelings. He lived as a man among and with other people. Jesus was able to offer the most complete, the most genuine and perfect expression of what it means to be human. He celebrates at the wedding feast of Cana. He enjoy and, and makes sure that they, at his mother's request, they have enough wine. He visits a, a friend's family. Um, and, and then he's also moved by a hungry crowd. And he visits uh, Lazarus, Mar Martha, and Mary and shares hospitality with them. The crowd is hungry, and the disciples said, let's let them go home and get something to eat, and he feeds them. He has empathy for their hunger. Uh, and he also uh, gives the sick and even dead children back to their parents, as with Jairus' daughter and the widow's son I just mentioned, and the, the servant of the uh, uh, man, who the centurion. And they wept at the death of Lazarus. People could see how he loved him. Yeah, but why didn't he raise him up? Well, he does raise him up but even more miraculous than they thought. So also about priests. The people of God should say about the priest what we say about Jesus. Quoting from the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 4, verse 15, where it says about Jesus, but also about us. For we have not a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So Christ knows what it's like to be human, and we priests have to have that same sense so we understand our people and cherish them in their humanity. Now we go to the spiritual dimension of a priest formation. This is required by the gospel life, and that the Holy Spirit, who is poured out in holy orders, when we, we priests receive the sacrament of holy orders, we receive the Holy Spirit. And that's going to be a call to the spiritual life. The Holy Spirit consecrates the priest in the sacrament, but also configures the priest to Jesus Christ, that we priests share that priesthood. That's what we call ourselves priests. Christ is the high priest, but we share in that priesthood, and we should become more and more like Jesus. So uh, the high priest and also as the head of the church, and also as the good shepherd of the church. This is what has been the theme throughout this whole exhortation, that we priests are to be configured to Christ, the head and shepherd of the church. There should be a, the Holy Spirit will create a bond inside the, the priest's own being, inside his own soul. It should create a bond between the priest to, and, and Jesus, so that even though we do it freely and consciously, it's not something that happens automatically. We have to conform ourselves to it and do so freely. But we are to have a more broad and more radical sharing in the feelings and attitudes of Jesus Christ because of that bond that the Holy Spirit gives us with Jesus the High Priest. And we, just that you married people are sharing a bond of Christ the bridegroom and his church. 
and that you live out that bond and should be conformed to that love relationship, we priests should be conformed to Christ and, and what he does. And that in this bond between the Lord Jesus Christ and the priest, that which is, first of all, an ontological bond and a psychological one. Ontological. What is that? That's a big word, isn't it? That's from philosophy. And it has to do with the word for being. So this is a bond in our very being. That's why the priesthood gives an indelible character in our souls. And our very souls are bonded with his through that indelible stamp of priesthood. But it's also psychological. It affects the way we think and feel. And it's also going to be um, a, a bond that is sacramental by, by, by coming from holy orders and moral, that I should act as Jesus does morally. And this bond is the foundation as well as the power for life according to the Spirit. We priests don't have a power for our spiritual life coming from our own human self, but it's a bond that comes from Jesus that gives us the vitality for that spiritual life and for the radicalism of the gospel to which every priest is called. And his formation in the spiritual life and the ongoing formation is to help nurture that. This formation is necessary for the priest's ministry to be genuine and spiritually fruitful. If the priest is not developing his spiritual life, it'll show up in his ministry. He'll be hollow. It's like a bell. When a bell is a cheap bell, you, you, know, you might have seen or heard crystal bells. You might have some at home. Versus a cowbell. A cowbell sort of clangs. It's cheap because cows are stupid. And they don't need very good bells. The kind of ding-dongs of their own. But a crystal bell has another ring to it, doesn't it? And a resonance, if you hold it, it, it vibrates, doesn't it? The priest should have that resonance of the spiritual life inside of him uh, and not be a cowbell that sort of clangs along. Makes noise, but just clangs. That's why the Pope uh, quotes from St. Charles Borromeo, who once said in a talk to priests, he was the bishop of Milan back in the 16th century, uh, and it says, uh, are you exercising care of souls? To the priest, he says that. Do not thereby neglect yourself. Do not give yourself to others to such an extent that nothing is left of yourself for yourself. You should certainly keep in mind the souls whose past you are, but without forgetting yourself, develop their souls, but also develop your own so that you have something to give. And it continues, My brothers, do not forget that there is nothing so necessary to all churchmen than the meditation which precedes, accompanies, and follows all of our actions. So the priest must meditate. I will sing, says the prophet, and I will meditate from Psalm 101, or from Psalm 100, verse 1. And if you administer the sacraments, my brother, meditate upon what you are doing. If you celebrate Mass, meditate on what you are offering. If you recite the Psalms and choir, meditate on whom and of what you are speaking, namely God. If you are guiding souls, meditate in whose blood they have been cleansed, namely the blood of Jesus. And let all be done among you in charity. This is the call that he requires for our spiritual life. Thus, we will be able to overcome the difficulties we meet, countless as they are, each day. In any event, this is what is demanded of us by the task entrusted to us. If we act thus, we will find the strength to give birth to Christ in ourselves and in others, so that we will have this prayer life that is constantly reformed, that you can't live off the past that you've done in the prayer, but you have to extend, you know, renew fidelity to times of prayer, especially the liturgy of the hours, the office, and strive constantly to have a personal 
encounter with Jesus Christ, a trusting dialogue with God the Father, and a deep experience of the Holy Spirit. Without that, the priest has nothing to offer. And may God bless you in the same Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.